Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Melissa Stiles, and I'm the Director of Faculty Development for the department. So I have uh, the pleasure of getting to introduce um, my friend and colleague, uh, going back to residency, uh, Dr. John Tempty. As most of us know, John is a professor in the uh, Department of Family Medicine and Community Health. He is also the Associate Dean uh, for Public Health and Community Engagement for this UW School of um, Medicine. Uh, he's well known to be an expert in vaccines and policy related uh, to vaccines and public health. He's had numerous awards, including receiving the 2018 AAFP Public Health Award. And we're so glad he can help us navigate uh, during these uncertain times of the pandemic. And today he is going to be presenting on uh, latest in terms of COVID-19 data, and then kind of going forward on uh, metrics, indicators, and gating criteria. Thank you so much, John. Well, thank you so much, Melissa. It's really a pleasure to uh, talk to you. Unfortunately, it's about something that is not uh, seeming like it's getting any better of late. But I thought I'd uh, spend the next few minutes providing a very graphical tour of COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2 that just want to try and provide a little bit of understanding on the breadth and complexity of data that is currently being collected on the SARS-CoV-2 virus and the disease it causes called COVID-19. And oftentimes we use these two things interchangeably, but one is the, the pathogen and the other is the disease state. Also, just want people to understand how data are interwoven for our current situational awareness, for decision-making processes in public health, uh, sometimes for prognostication. And then also, uh, I'll try and give some caveats about uh, being aware of the limitations on data and interpretation. Really quick, uh, I want to spend time talking about uh, the global picture and then zooming in on the United States, uh, Wisconsin, and Dane County. And then looking forward into summer uh, and autumn and beyond. So let's start with kind of the global view out there. And I'm going to introduce you, if you're not aware of uh, some of the resources out there for situation awareness. And I'm going to actually start with the very first presentation that I was part of on COVID-19. Uh, back when we didn't even call it COVID-19, this was the Wuhan coronavirus, uh, 2019 uh, novel coronavirus. And this is from a presentation we had uh, at the uh, the School of Medicine and Public Health on January 27th. And I just want to remind people that at this point in time, globally, we had 4,700 cases and around 300 deaths. And all the deaths at that time were in China. If we fast forward, uh, and this is from yesterday and it is already out of date. Uh, we're over uh, 13 million cases so far and close to six or 600,000 deaths. But this is the desktop uh, from John Hopkins University. And this is the one that you see used uh, by the news media and others. But this provides really nice uh, uh, updates on what's happening globally. And you can drill down into countries, into states, and other administrative regions. But I'm going to have you focus on the lower right-hand corner. And I'll bring that up. And this is the cumulative cases so far. And the one teaching point I have here is taking a look at the shape of that curve. And um, I'm going to superimpose a straight line. And we see this nice uh, curve coming up. And whenever you see that, we know that things are expanding exponentially. Uh, if it's a straight line uh, that corresponds with a infectious agent with a basic reproductive number of one, 
Uh, it means that every case begets one other case and you have a linear growth. But here we're curving up. So we know that uh, across the world, that basic reproductive number of SARS-CoV-2 is greater than one. On the other hand, sometimes we see a flattening of the curve and that indicates we're getting below one for that basic reproductive number. Here is the log function of that same curve. And you can see that uh, of late, we've been just moving along very, very linearly. Um, and with a logarithmic curve, that means we are still in an exponential phase. We're looking for that again to flatten on out. And one other way we look at things is just the number of new cases per day. And ominously, we see that across the world, we're on a steady increase. If you take a look toward the bottom left-hand side, that was that initial spike uh, across China uh, that kind of went away and then everything took off thereafter. Okay, let me just show you now, when we look uh, at individual countries, uh, here is the United States where we see a big upswing uh, in March and April. Uh, it flattens out, drops down, and then explodes again. Uh, Germany is another uh, fully developed economy, a very uh, similar country to the United States, but they did something right there. You see things come up uh, suddenly in March and goes down and keeps at low level. India, on the other hand, is experiencing very quick exponential growth. And one other example I pulled out was Australia and bringing this out because Australia looks very much like Germany initially. They had it under, under control. And then in uh, June and July, Australia is entering the Southern Hemisphere winter. And so keep in mind that the other coronaviruses are highly seasonal. Uh, so the four common ones we see in Wisconsin are present from October through about April. So moving along, just want to uh, show uh, one other thing here, which is the uh, number of global deaths. And using the deaths and the total number of cases, we can construct a crude case fatality rate, four and a half or 4.4% now. But keep in mind that uh, that is full of flaws uh, simply because the cases tend to uh, occur about two to three weeks before the mortality. So basically what you would have to do is compare the mortality today to the number of cases two to three weeks ago to get a more fair estimate. Well, now I'm gonna drill down and take us uh, to the US and give a little bit of an update here. This again, again comes from the John Hopkins, uh, but uh, John Beasley will appreciate this. Uh, these are a rendition of cases across the country, but this is very similar to if you're up in a plane at, oh, about uh, uh, 80 miles up at nighttime looking down at the light, you, you see, cases are clustered and concentrated around urban populations. And keep in mind with a transmittable virus that the fuel is proximity. Uh, as long as we're close to each other, we can easily spread this virus. I'm gonna also just show across the country some examples of different states. So here's New York. Uh, New York, was hit really, really hard. Um, it exploded in March into April, but they really shut things down. They did the distancing, face masking closures, and things largely went away. On the other hand, here's Texas, which is uh, slow to start, but now exploding. And unfortunately, Wisconsin has elements of both. We see an increase from March uh, through the end of May, dropping down a little bit, uh, but unfortunately now coming up very quickly. Some of this can be explained uh, as people do that, oh, we're just testing more. 
And in fact, in the United States, since March 1st, uh, we've had over 22 million tests performed. This is data through July 4th from CDC. And the number of positives at that time was uh, a little bit over uh, 2.1 million cases. Uh, these obviously increase uh, day by day and week by week. But this gives you a, a, a gross estimate of how much is out there. Keep in mind, since we started, the average percent positivity has been over 9%. But looking at data another way, we see that um, initially there was uh, very little testing. The testing has grown, and this graph shows the testing color-coded by age in the vertical bars. And you really see a peak. Uh, if you look at the black line, that's the overall percent positivity. And that peaked out at about, oh, 17, 18% uh, in the late spring and has drifted down now and running around 5% positivity. And this tells us something about the intensity, not only of the outbreak, but the intensity of our testing. Uh, if we do a whole lot more testing, it pushes that percent positivity down. If we do less testing and test only the symptomatic people, uh, it forces that on up. But just keep in mind that there are traps when you look simply at the amount of testing. I threw the next figure in, and I'll just mention very quickly, every week CDC publishes a COVID view, uh, and you can get to that using the URL at the bottom of the slide. But I threw this in because CDC keeps track of influence like illness, and what's remarkable about this graphic is that with the closure of schools across the United States, and if you're looking on this, this is around uh, week 2020-14 uh, when schools closed and influence like illness just plummeted. And here in Wisconsin, as soon as uh, schools closed uh, between the uh, 13th and 18th of March, influenza totally disappeared. Uh, so speaks to the, at least the beneficial effect of school closure on influenza. We do not know to what extent SARS will blow up once schools are back in session. And if you've been following the news media, uh, this is an area of tremendous debate going on right now. Well, another thing we look at is hospitalization. And this is, again, national data. Uh, this comes from a number of Sentinel hospitals uh, across the country that record reasons for admission. Uh, against a denominator. And the thing to point out here is that the overall rate uh, at this point in time for cumulative hospitalization has been about one hospitalization for every 932 people in this country. If we look at the older age group over the age of 65, uh, it's now one out of every 315 elders who has been hospitalized. This is quite remarkable, and let me just show you in context. These are uh, figures on mortality. This is data that emerges from 122 metropolitan areas that weekly record the number of deaths and the reason for the, uh, for the death. And if you take a look at the uh, black dual bar or lines at the bottom, that's the seasonal baseline and threshold. And the red line are the combined deaths due to pneumonia, influenza, and COVID-19. And obviously back in 2018, toward the left side of this graph, there was no COVID-19 uh, in the US. Uh, and what you've seen there is a fairly significant influenza outbreak where we hit a uh, whopping 11% of deaths in the United States for one week were due to influenza. If we look at 2018-19 uh, influenza year, it really doesn't cause a whole lot of deaths uh, in, in adults or other people in this country. But now, if, as we approach into uh, 2020, 
you see this enormous spike that we have never seen the likes of ever before. And for one week, we hit about 27% of all deaths in the United States were due to the combination of influenza, pneumonia, and COVID-19. But I'll give it away that there wasn't any influenza circulating at that time. And pneumonia should have been on its way down. So that spike you see is all COVID-19. So going back to this graphic, uh, it just gives us a, a chance if we drill in the United States with yesterday's 3.3 uh, million cases and 135,000 deaths, uh, we find that our crude case fatality rate was about 4%. And again, um, that is only a crude measure. Uh, don't believe it. Uh, and again, it's only for reported identified cases. And with something that has a lot of asymptomatic infections, you can understandably see that the case fatality rate is probably lower. On the other hand, the lag between cases and fatalities creates uh, a uh, problem with a number being too low. So uh, one will know or become smarter with the passage of time. Now I'm gonna move on and spend a little time talking about Wisconsin and what we're seeing here. So this is data that is fully accessible on the Department of Health Services website. And they have a very good and continuously populated dashboard, which is worthwhile taking a look at. And this gives us the cumulative curve going all the way back into March. And what I want to point out here is, like we're seeing elsewhere, we're seeing this curve is bowed. Uh, it's not straight. And that indicates that, unfortunately, Wisconsin is increasing on an exponential uh, scale with this virus. If we take a look uh, in terms of number of cases per day, uh, kind of point out that uh, this graphic uh, shows our new high point uh, at 928 cases uh, about three days ago. And unfortunately, we've seen uh, an ongoing escalation. Uh, for those who uh, wish to try and tease out things in here, you might be able to uh, pick out an inflection about two weeks after our in-person voting in the state. Uh, we definitely see an inflection about two weeks after the Memorial Day weekend. Um, and unfortunately, in our state, we had uh, uh, a lot of efforts made to reduce the social distancing and the face masking and other things that were actually very successful. And now we're unfortunately uh, rising very, very quickly. Well, let's take a look at who is getting sick here. So this is data that uh, is collected and reported by the state. Every person who goes in to have a COVID-19 test performed at any testing center, at a hospital, uh, at clinics, uh, at the drive-through centers, it has to be accompanied by the Wisconsin COVID-19 patient information form. And that contains some of the basic elements of demographics, of symptoms, and other information. And so to start out, uh, as of uh, yesterday, what we saw was the great predominance, 25% of cases are in the 20s. And this has changed uh, dramatically over the past uh, few weeks. But right now, the biggest element uh, becoming infected are the younger adults. And you can see uh, fewer children uh, from zero to nine and 10 to 19 and it drops off with age. But keep in mind also, and especially those of you who are parents out there, that we have been uh, experiencing a period of time 
when kids have been largely free of respiratory infections from about mid-March on. Uh, we do some monitoring uh, across the Oregon School District, and we've seen very, very low rates of uh, family uh, prevalence of colds and cold symptoms. So I just worry about that demographic when schools come back into session. If we move along and take a look at who's hospitalized, uh, it looks a little bit different. So only 3% of those 20 to 29 year olds are hospitalized. So they're, they're uh, essentially doing a good job of spreading uh, disease, but it's the 80 to 89 year olds that make up uh, a big, big chunk of uh, the cases. The way to look at this is 45% of those individuals age 80 to 89 are hospitalized. 40% of people who are in their 70s are hospitalized, and in the 60s, almost a quarter. Um, so very worrisome uh, for older individuals if they encounter the younger adults who have been uh, not social distancing. Similarly, if we take a look at intensive care utilization, uh, we get something very similar. So uh, that 70 to 79 has the highest uh, and very low utilization uh, in children, uh, people under the age of about 30. And then finally, if we look at uh, deaths in Wisconsin, the majority uh, have been uh, in that oldest age cohort, people over 90. But you, you find this stepwise increase uh, with advancing age once you hit the 40s. And this is something that has been shown consistently from the earliest publications emanating out of China to an earlier report in, uh, by the CDC and MMWR. And it has continuously uh, been a disease that has caused hospitalization, ICU, and death in our older individuals. Now, interestingly, uh, COVID-19 has not had any uh, sex or gender differences. Basically, about 51% of Wisconsin's population is female, and this is what we're seeing in terms of cases altogether. Uh, there were reports earlier uh, across the world of males being hit harder. And in fact, uh, males may be more represented in hospitalization than females. But in terms of who's getting this disease, uh, it's fairly equally distributed. On the other hand, there are really, really significant disparities when we start looking at things like race and ethnicity. And here, what we find is in Wisconsin, 58% of the cases have been in whites, 17% in African Americans, about 4% in Asian or Pacific Islanders, and about 1% in American Indians. If you take a look at Wisconsin demographics, you'll find that the white cohort is underrepresented and African Americans are about three times higher than you would expect based on their proportion within the population. Likewise, uh, Asian and Pacific Islanders are elevated. Uh, and I don't know if I fully trust the data on American Indian. Uh, across the United States, in particular across the Navajo Nation uh, in the Southwest, this has been a devastating uh, infectious disease. So similar to the race, when we look at ethnicity, um, and keeping in mind that Wisconsin's population is 6% uh, Latino, we find a great excess of cases in this population. And similarly, a great, uh, greatly diminished amount in the non-Latina population. And one can kind of ask why that is. Um, there are issues around underlying medical conditions. 
in Wisconsin in particular, there have been issues around uh, some industries that have a high Latino population and very, very poor workplace conditions uh, that have led to some significant outbreaks that we'll touch upon in a little bit here. So if we take a look across the state by region, uh, COVID-19 has particularly hit hard in the southeastern corner of Wisconsin uh, and also in the southern area and has largely spared the northern uh, section of Wisconsin. On the other hand, the population is kind of distributed like this, uh, so it's not terribly surprising. If we actually look at rates, however, we see the counties of Milwaukee uh, and the southeast part of the state, and then Brown County up around Green Bay have been the hardest hit. And I really want to uh, point out that the Green Bay area uh, has the high levels predominantly due to a number of outbreaks in meat processing facilities. And the meat processing facilities do not have a equal representation of various uh, uh, ethnic groups. Uh, they have had much higher Latina population and that has driven to some extent uh, some of the disparity there. If we change our focus a little bit and look at healthcare workers, I just want to point out that so far in Wisconsin, we have seen uh, well over 3,000 healthcare workers uh, come down with COVID-19. A couple things that I'll, I'll mention very, very quickly is that at the uh, UW hospital, there has been uh, an effort to be able to take specimens and get to one of the laboratories on campus with uh, Tom Friedrich and Dave O'Connor, who are able to do uh, rapid sequencing and mapping of the viruses. And the good news is that so far, despite the fact that there have been a number of people within the UW health system become ill with this, there has been no documentation of spread from a patient to a healthcare provider. Uh, so almost everything we're seeing in healthcare providers are coming from the community and not from the healthcare setting. Uh, this is because since fairly, fairly early on, we've been very, very good about the personal protective equipment. We've been uh, good about uh, isolating patients uh, with known COVID-19, being aggressive in uh, early uh, testing of patients and so on. But the the adage that the healthcare arena, if your healthcare provider is actually pretty safe, I think continues to be uh, a, a true adage, as long as you're following that appropriate uh, precaution. If we take a look at deaths across Wisconsin, uh, we see that uh, they really peaked out uh, toward the end of May and have been dropping down. Unfortunately, as we're seeing things escalate right now, and in particular having the highest number of cases ever reported three days ago, we'll just have to watch and see what happens here. If we do a crude case fatality rate for Wisconsin, we get about two and a half percent. And then let me just mention a little bit on capacity. So this is one of the uh, tools that you can get to through the DHS webpage. And very quickly, uh, we are able to ascertain that Wisconsin has a total of 11,409 hospital beds. And the bed availability right now is about 25%. We can look here, see what the number of patients with uh, uh, COVID-19 are, uh, 283, and 85 of which are in the ICU, and 143 are waiting for their tests to come back. And then finally, toward the bottom, we see that our total state supply of ventilators is 1,256 
and the number of people on ventilators right now at 296. So one would say that uh, our uh, facilities and our resources are actually quite good at, at this point in time. Compare this to Phoenix uh, and Miami uh, and Houston, and we're sitting uh, quite well right now. The last thing I'll mention here is just on testing across Wisconsin. And if you take a look uh, on this, we know that we've had about 37,000 positive tests so far out of about 700,000 tests performed. And this is as of a couple days ago. So uh, one other way to look at this is our test positive rate across the board averaged over the entire time has been 5.3%. So that's where we kind of are for the state of Wisconsin. If we move to a little bit closer to home uh, and Dane County, we'll just kind of run through here. And unfortunately, uh, here's our dashboard for Dane County. Uh, we have had over 3,000 cases so far, 247 hospitalizations and 33 deaths. I'm not going to go into the age uh, demographics. Um, at this point in time, or uh, race, uh, ethnicity, but only point out that uh, using this uh, data dashboard for Dane County, uh, we're able to drill down and look at uh, confirmed cases by age, by race, by sex, and by ethnicity. We can look at hospitalization, and we can look at death across those parameters as well. The thing about it is, that we see not a whole lot of differences based on, on sex and gender, but we definitely do by race and ethnicity. And again, the very similar patterns based on age as what I showed for the state of Wisconsin. Now, this is the cumulative case count in Dane County, and we see a tremendous inflection point uh, in late June. Uh, and I think this really corresponds to the relaxation of social distancing, uh, the use of appropriate face masking and so on. And this is a very tenacious virus. And as soon as you let down the guard, it's gonna take that opportunity uh, and spread. If we take a look at the cases per day uh, in Dane County, uh, we've seen a real big upswing here starting again in, in about mid-June. And I suspect uh, this is going to continue like this unless we go back into some shutdown. The, uh, the bars show the daily counts and the line is the seven-day moving average, by the way. So uh, if we take a look at the percent positivity, again, that's the number of tests that are positive against the number of tests that were performed. We see that lately it has just exploded. Um, and so that takes us to kind of where we are today in the midst of uh, an ongoing and significant uh, outbreak of SARS-CoV-2. The consequences of this include a continuing inpatient present in, or inpatient presence in, in Dane County. And as you can see, last count, we had 27 patients in the hospital. And unfortunately, uh, you know, these are not just numbers, but these are people who are really uh, having significant problems. And the more we see, uh, the more we realize that there are not only the short-term consequences of COVID-19, but there are a lot of long-term cognitive, respiratory, and other factors that will linger on a number of these patients for weeks and or months. So with that in mind, I'm just gonna mention a little bit about the gating criteria and moving along the continuum from uh, the 
lockdown to freedom and nor normalcy again. Um, so this is within the Madison or the Public Health Madison and Dane County Forward Dane Plan. And to move to phase one, all nine of the metrics used by Dane County have to be in a yellow or green phase to go from. And so uh, we've already moved into phase one and we've actually moved into phase two. And this was assessed 14 days after the implementation of phase one. And so this was uh, uh, looked at in uh, early June. Um, and then this is something that is ongoing. And to move along, more than half the metrics have to be in the green zone uh, and the epidemiolo our epidemiology criteria, which is the percent positive tests and the cases per day must not be in red. So let me kind of take you through the, uh, the metrics here in Chistis or the gating criteria. Going from phase two to three, uh, you know, at 14 day intervals after phase two. And this is where calf metrics have to be green and none can be red either in Dane County or Southern region. And then phase three will continue until widespread protections are available, such as a vaccine or a cheap, effective antiviral. Um, and I'm not holding my breath on either of those. So, here are the forward Dane metrics. So the first is the positive or the percent positivity of testing. And we want this to be below 5% uh, averaged across the most recent 14 day period. And guess what? We're not there with that. Uh, we're well above. If we look at cases per day, uh, we want below an incidence threshold of four cases per day for Dane County. And uh, if you go back a, a few slides, you can see that we're nowhere near that. Uh, uh, and I suspect we won't for a very long time. For tests conducted, uh, testing supplies and staff facilities have to be adequate for testing uh, for both disease control and surveillance and a goal of over 800 tests per day. And Dane County is actually doing this. And we're ramping up on the Madison campus, the UW-Madison campus, uh, working with the Veterinary Diagnostic Lab to have a throughput of 6,000 cases per week. This is gonna be used largely for monitoring and surveillance on the UW-Madison campus, but this will provide a lot of ongoing information for Madison and Dane County as well. Uh, next is the testing for healthcare workers, and we're actually doing a very, very good job. Uh, we have adequate testing for any healthcare worker who is deemed appropriate for testing. Uh, next is patients being treated without crisis care, and uh, so we're able to treat all patients without any crisis standards of care including the facility use, staffing, and critical supplies. And if you uh, reflect back to that dashboard I showed you for Wisconsin, uh, Wisconsin is in good shape right now, and there's no area in the state where we're under a crisis standard of care. If we look at healthcare workers, uh, we look for a stable or decreasing number of infected healthcare workers over a 14-day period, and we're doing well there. Lab reporting timeliness and contact tracing has been a problem. Uh, it's really, especially when there are a lot of cases emerging, the contact tracing becomes nearly impossible. Uh, and it's really hard to have enough personnel. The other problem is the turnaround time we're finding from a lot of the uh, locations. Uh, we're hoping on campus to have a turnaround time of uh, 12 to 36 hours maximum, uh, and we'll see how that goes. But again, oftentimes when you have a turnaround time that stretches to four to five days, if you can imagine the number of contacts people will have between testing and reporting if they're not quarantining. Uh, community spread is the next one. So the proportion of contacted COVID-19 cases 
who don't know where they could have gotten this. Uh, we're doing fair with this. And then the last is the uh, COVID-like symptoms. And this is the one that I have the biggest problem with because we don't have any really good way of assessing uh, COVID-like sy symptoms appearing into clinics because most of our clinics are no longer functioning uh, and are excluding cases like this. So for example, uh, I've monitored influenza-like illness for years and years out of clinics and I can't do that anymore because we no longer allow patients with flu-like illness into your clinics. Likewise, uh, there's real limitations of people uh, coming into clinical sites, into urgent care, and so on. So I don't really trust uh, this parameter all that much. Okay, so I'm just going to finish up here. And just for quick review, uh, just mention that SARS-CoV-2 is a global pandemic. And across the world, it is still accelerating. Uh, this is not going away. It did not go away with the summer weather. It did not go away um, by saying it went away. It is out there, and it is a significant pandemic. Uh, the United States has failed in containment so far. Um, on the flip side, we know that physical distancing, that face mask, hand hygiene, things like symptom checking, um, staying home while ill are all things that work beautifully. Uh, we just need to have the wisdom to use these things. The metrics in Wisconsin are concerning at present. Uh, and on top of that, we see these really significant inequities across age, race, and ethnicity. And, you know, in our own back door, we are experiencing in Dane County widespread transmission. And at this point, we're unable to move forward uh, because all the gating criteria are going in the wrong direction. Now, one can ask, could we see this coming? And I'm putting this up simply because this is one of my favorite papers looking at predicting and prognosticating. And this paper was published in Science three months ago. And this is telling us exactly what we're seeing today. Uh, the graphic you know, shows a timeline from January to January. And the blue bar going from April to July is an eight week shutdown. And then the curves uh, demonstrate uh, the black is a 0% reduction in the basic reproductive number. Red is 20% reduction. Blue is 40% and green is 60% reduction. And the way we get to the reduction is through distancing, face masking, hand hygiene, quarantining. And I'll argue that we were probably somewhere between 40 and 60% with the efforts made with school closure, with distancing, with changes in clinical behavior, and so on. Um, and what we found is in April, things came up and came back on down. And now in July, we're kind of following the trajectory of those green lines. The solid line is cases. The dotted line are the critical cases. I think we're looking at perhaps a pretty devastating rest of the summer and into the fall uh, in terms of cases out there. Again, this is a virus that will take its opportunity to spread very, very easily. And unfortunately, the people who are in their 20s who are spreading right now are not getting uh, uh, disease, but unfortunately, they are capable of spreading to uh, older individuals, their parents, uh, other contacts, coworkers, and so on. And so I think we just have to bear in mind that uh, this is something that's out there and we have to take very seriously. So I'm going to finish up here uh, a uh, quote from the uh, 1920s. 
and I'll see if there are any questions. So thank you so much for uh, your time and attention. Thank you so much, John. And uh, we already have a couple questions coming in. Um, one question I wanted to ask, uh, John, is regarding the number of people uh, recovered. And so there's always a number of people recovered on the John Hopkins or you, you pointed out on the Dane County side. Is that based just on lab? Are these people truly recovered? Kind of going back to your comment about the long term consequences. Um, and so I just wanted to see how recovery is based. Yeah, that's a great question. And to be honest, uh, I, I've never really paid much attention to that because it's fairly nebulous. At one point in time, recovered were defined as the people who were uh, either hospitalized and now out of the hospital or people who were not hospitalized in at least two weeks after the onset. And so, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure many of us on this call can relate to patients that we have seen that may have had this. I, I remember in particular uh, one woman who was in her 40s who had an illness that was uh, pretty intense and she was better, but for the uh, following six weeks had had daily fevers up to 100 degrees and was no longer able to go up the stairway without having to sit down for 15 minutes to catch your breath. And this is somebody who biked 12 miles a day uh, before this. Um, so uh, the, the recovery is not a really fair measure of freedom from impairment. Uh, so keep that in mind. And I think the more we see, the more we're seeing that a lot of these patients have a very, very long road ahead. And I, I just have to reflect, you know, recently saw the video of somebody who had spent uh, 93 days in the hospital uh, being wheeled out. And you can just look at this person and say, you know, we're looking at uh, six to 12 months of physical therapy, occupational therapy, probably speech therapy because he had the, uh, the uh, tracheostomy scar. Uh, from, you know, spending a long time on an uh, event. So uh, recover, recovery is probably not a good term. Uh, so just starting from uh, the top from uh, Mary, how is Wisconsin doing in terms of PPE supplies? Right now, we think we're doing pretty well. And um, that we have a weekly uh, conversation, at least with the UW Health uh, incident commander and so on. And so for the UW system, we've been sitting actually quite well. That being said, uh, we have to be cautious and careful with the utilization. And so to some extent, uh, we find that there is reluctance to go too far in terms of um, opening the clinics up uh, for patients who could be infected with that in mind. If you look more broadly across the nation, unfortunately, even though we're six months into this, we're facing shortages of PPE across the country, particularly across the South where things are surging right now. So um, things are better, uh, but I, I would say the big picture is they're not great. And next question, uh, John is uh, from Kathy Rosema. Uh, what is your prediction about these numbers now that the county mask mandate is in place in, in Dane County? Well, I, I think with this virus, anytime you increase your efforts to slow it down. And so putting into place the distancing, putting into place masking, that will slow it down. Uh, absolutely. So uh, my, my prediction is within a couple of weeks, if we're very successful with masking, we're going to see it drop on down. And the worry is that there are forces out there that uh, require you to back down from there, uh, whether it's business opening, uh, the reopening re, uh, of schools and so on. And anything that we do that increases proximity to people. Uh, and you can almost think of that, that face mask as something that incre or decreases proximity 
uh, in, in a, a funny sort of way. But anything that, that you increase that proximity is going to be associated with worsening, and anything that uh, is associated with decreasing that proximity uh, or reducing the ability to transmit will be a good thing uh, in com combating this pandemic. Uh, next question is from Ali Couture. With increasing antibody testing, can any information be discussed about symptomatic transmission versus asymptomatic transmission rates? Um, well, that, that's a good question, and I think it's going to take uh, more, more data out there. Uh, one of the biggest problems we've had right now has been with the uh, high levels of false positive and false negative from the antibody testing. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's really kind of difficult. The other problem we have had since the very beginning, uh, and even though uh, we, we know how to do this, and we, we've known how to do, do this for 20 years, uh, there was never any good effort taken to do uh, what I would call broad population surveillance, looking at uh, a true denominator and looking at who's getting this, uh, who's symptomatic, who's asymptomatic, and so on. Uh, almost everything we know has been triggered off by very, very uh, directed testing, either for symptomatic or people who have uh, exposed or people who are worried and think they might be exposed. But we uh, have not had sufficient information about kind of that larger uh, group out there uh, so uh, we see anywhere from estimates of uh, nine out of ten uh, people being asymptomatic with this to about you know one out of five being asymptomatic, and uh, this will come out, but it's not really clear right now. Uh, the next uh, question from uh, Ben Tron is talking about is related to vaccines. Can you discuss your thoughts, hopes on vaccine development, given the lack of success in developing vaccines for other types of coronavirus? Uh, yeah, so uh, i actually giving a talk on this tomorrow for the State Medical Society over the noon hour. Okay. Uh, but there are three vaccines in clinical trials in the U.S. and probably about 12 to 14 uh, elsewhere. Uh, we started out with about 120 candidate vaccines. And so this has been great in terms of just an incredibly wide uh, variety of vaccines uh, under development out there. The challenge uh, really comes in uh, assessing whether or not the ability to make an antibody is correlated with the ability to pre prevent clinical illness. Uh, and whether or not uh, the vaccine is safe and tolerable, and uh, whether or not being vaccinated uh, sets you up for a vaccine-mediated uh, worsening if you become ill naturally. Uh, mm -hmm. Plus, uh, if you make it, will people come? Uh, so already there's a huge amount of campaigning out there by the anti-vaccine community to try and get people not to accept the vaccine. And so um, I, I'm, I'm hopeful. Uh, I think the candidates out there are looking reasonable. Uh, they're entering the phase three trials now, phase two and phase three. And once we have a little bit more data, uh, then I think things will move uh, forward. The FDA has set kind of a, a benchmark that a vaccine has to have at least 50% uh, effectiveness uh, to be approved, which means that uh, if you're vaccinated, your chance of coming down with disease is 50% reduced. Now, the other thing you have to be aware of is that in the trials, most everybody is a young, healthy person, uh, and they're powered uh, mostly to look at whether or not you become infected with uh, the virus as shown by PCR, as opposed to uh, will it prevent clinical illness, hospitalization, ICU, or death? Uh, the trials won't be powered large enough to give us any information on that. And then the, the challenges get into the uh, subsets of people. Uh, so pregnant women, uh, people over the age of 85, uh, 
uh, are, are there going to be sufficient uh, African American, Latino uh, individuals in the trials to be able to uh, make those communities feel comfortable with a vaccine? So there, there are just so many nuances out there that, uh, but it, it is what we, it is, and this is moving along very, very rapidly. And I, I hope uh, we, we do see something. I'm, I'm still thinking that it's not likely that we see anything uh, for uh, probably another uh, 10 months or so. Uh, but there are some people hopeful for, for January. And uh, you know, somewhat related to that in terms of immunity, can you comment on um, immunity after having COVID? Um, this is an area, there's a lot of controversy. Uh, uh, some of you may have seen a recent uh, uh, case report from an internist out in the uh, Northeast with a, a patient who came down with uh, COVID-19, uh, recovered, wasn't too sick the first time around, uh, subsequently had two negative PCRs and six weeks later came down with COVID-19 again and became very, very ill. Um, and I, I think that the lesson is if we look at the four other seasonal coronaviruses out there, we know that the immunity for those tends to be uh, short, uh, months to uh, maybe two years. People can come down with these uh, viruses again and again over their lifetime. And uh, we just don't know enough about this particular virus to give an, an accurate response to that. Uh, but my suspicion is this is one that uh, having a, a case uh, will provide some immunity and may uh, help with that uh, next time you're exposed. He may become infected, he might be able to spread, but he might not uh, be able to, or might not get that ill with it. So that, that's kind of the, the hopeful or the optimistic view. And you know, somewhat related to that, there are definitely been patients that continue to test positive and they never turn negative after their initial illness. Um, can you comment on that, that subset? Yeah, so P PCR, uh, polymerase chain reaction is a wonderful tool. Uh, because it's incredibly sensitive, but uh, it cannot tell the difference between a live virus, uh, a replicating virus, and uh, viral debris. And so one of the problems we have is to actually look at viability is a challenging thing. Uh, so once somebody's infected, uh, they continue to shed viable virus uh, for typically two weeks or so. Uh, but beyond that, uh, you know, there, there's detection that can go out, you know, 20, 30 days in some cases, perhaps a little bit longer. Uh, and what we, we do know is the amount of virus being shed drops down significantly. Um, the viability is uncertain, but probably not viable. And so uh, I, I'm fairly confident that you know, that window of transmissibility is from about two days before symptoms to about 14 days after. Uh, unfortunately, uh, many people are, can be asymptomatic or uh, low symptoms. You know, uh, for example, middle of the night, uh, uh, I noticed last night my nose was running, but the air conditioner was on. And, you know, you kind of go, Oh, do I have something here, or is it just part of the the environment that's triggering this off? So, um, just with the wide variety of symptoms out there, it's really really hard to get a handle on this. Okay, and uh, we'll wrap up with the time with one more question, which uh, is an excellent. Uh, all the questions are excellent, but I think to end with this one. Um, what recommendations do you have on public health political advocacy? for resistant county boards, um, community members in and out of Dane County? Well, I, I think there needs to be a, a huge amount of advocacy for public health. Uh, uh, we have been in a decline in public health over 40 years now, and there's been a uh, concerted effort to defund public health uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, none of which are good, to be honest. So I, I think uh, the more people can uh, 
you know, even turn out to uh, Board of Health meetings, um, to listening sessions and so on. Uh, there was, I'll just give a quick for, uh, uh, example. Uh, this past, it seems like an eternity ago when we could actually go into a room with other people, but uh, there was a Medicine Board of Health uh, or Medicine Dane County Board of Health meeting on vaccine waivers. And uh, there were three people that showed up uh, to speak in favor of uh, reducing the ease of getting a waiver on vaccines. It was myself, Paul Smith, uh, retired from Belleville, and one other individual uh, against about 70 people who were turned out, you know, to take a very anti-vax standpoint. So I think the more that uh, physicians, uh, other healthcare providers, medical assistants, nurses, and so on can get out there amongst the public and, you know, talk about the importance of uh, public health approaches, you know, in particular uh, with this this virus, uh, we know from China uh, that doing nothing more than distancing, masking, quarantining, isolation when sick, doing a lot of testing, uh, this went away. And in this country, we're finding something totally is exploding. Uh, and this is all on the basis of public health measures that have been known for 150 years. So uh, public health actually does work. It's actually quite cheap um, and um, it's effective. So thanks. All right. Well, thank you so much, John. And I'll just uh, echo many of the comments here. What an excellent presentation. Thank you so much uh, for being with us today. Well, you're very welcome, and everybody, uh, keep, keep safe out there. Uh, keep your distance, use that mask, and keep healthy.